Okay, we're going to go ahead and kick things off. Again, welcome everyone. My name is Edward Tephorn. I am the Executive Director for the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. The foundation is the primary nonprofit partner for Angel Island State Park, which is a California historic landmark and a national historic landmark. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, just a quick history about Angel Island, which is from 1910 to 1940, part of the island served as a US immigration station where nearly 500,000 people were either processed or detained. Of those 300,000 were detained and the detainees represented people from over 80 different countries. But due to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, as well as a whole series of other exclusionary immigration policies, the majority of the detainees on Angel Island were from Asia and the Pacific. The site stopped being used as an immigration station in 1940 after a fire broke down in the broke out in the administration building. But during World War II, the site was used to house enemy POWs as well as about 700 Japanese and Japanese Americans from Hawaii in the Pacific before they were moved to other Department of Justice camps uh, along the US. And then afterwards, the site was uh, stewarded to California State Parks. Uh, and since then, the foundation has worked over the past 40 years to help raise nearly $40 million in public private funds to ensure that these important buildings continue to stand the test of time and serve as a reminder to all of us about this dark part of immigration and US history. I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce you to Samuel Porteous for tonight's author spotlight. Samuel is an award-winning Shanghai-based art artist and author who has been for almost 20 years living and working in China. For the last 10 years, he has been the chief creative director of Drowsy Emperor, a Hong Kong Shanghai-based small boutique design content studio. And he, the studio helps to serve Chinese and Western audiences. Samuel focuses on the special place that China holds in the Western imagination. His China analysis drawing on his earlier career as a top China-based corporate investigator and intelligence analyst has been published in multiple places, including the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, South China Morning Post, the Globe and Mail, and Hong Kong Standard, among others. He has also published widely in academic journals and authored groundbreaking government reports on the geopolitics of economic intelligence, trade policy, and even international organized crime. He is currently artist in residence at the Tanyuan Gardens, he also wrote and illustrated the graphic novel series Constable Kang's Mysteries of Old Shanghai for the China market, and it is actually now available on Amazon, and, and uh, later on we'll give you a couple of links where you can access both that as well as the book that we are featuring tonight, which is about Qing Ling Su. Qing Ling Fu, I'm sorry, Qing Ling Fu was a magician who came to the U.S. during the Omaha exhibition and later subsequently toured many vaudeville theaters across the U.S. as well as Europe and even Australia. And part of his travels brought him to the former U.S. immigration station on Angel Island, which is why we're so excited to be able to share with you some of Samuel's research and writings tonight. So Samuel, welcome to our August Author Spotlight. Hey, thank you very much, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. And before we actually dive into the book, I'm really curious about your experiences uh, for the past 20 years. You've lived and worked in China. What has that experience been like for you? It's been great. I actually came out to Asia in 2000, and I began in Singapore. And I was in Singapore for a year, then in Hong Kong. And then um, for about a 10-year period, I was splitting my time monthly between Hong Kong and Shanghai. Um, and uh, that led to uh, when I started Drowsy Emperor and with Drowsy Emperor, I tended to spend more time in Shanghai, but still coming back and forth between Hong Kong and Shanghai. And um, I've, I've enjoyed this time tremendously. The amount of change I've seen in 20 years in the region and within China has, as everyone knows, um, been quite uh, fascinating. And uh, it's been great to be here to see everything happen. And I bet living in all those places, those are also places that are renowned for their food and restaurants and the cuisine. So hopefully you've had a chance to take advantage of those as well. Uh, oh, absolutely. The, and it gets down to like, you know, the, the concept of Chinese food. Well, you know, the closer you get, the more that dissipates into a million different types of Chinese. And, you know, Huangshan, Yellow Mountain. Yes, absolutely. 
Uh, so it's been an absolute pleasure from a gustatory sense as well. Right, right. Well, uh, you know, with with Chingling Fu, he's actually not someone who I had heard about before. Uh, and he kept quite extraordinary company with some names that some of our viewers might be familiar with. People like family, Fanny Bryce. Uh, he performed in the Zigfield Follies. He was good friends with Harry Houdini. Uh, and so with your book, Chingling Fu, America's First Chinese, Chinese Superstar, if people can see that. Uh, I'm curious, how did you first learn about him? It began because most, as you indicated in your introduction, my art focuses on China and the Western imagination, how Westerners process China. Uh, Cause I think it's an important issue these days and has been for like over a decade and will continue to be. And in the process, I focus on popular culture. So in my research on popular culture and uh, Chinese uh, figures in popular culture, particularly after the gold rush, um, I came across uh, Chung Ling Su, who is the uh, slightly more famous version of Ching Ling Fu. And of course, Chung Ling Su is a, an American um, European who disguised himself as a Chinese and became the most popular, one of the most popular entertainers in Europe and London and notoriously died on stage. Um, and then it was revealed he wasn't in fact Chinese. He was an American European um, and had been presenting himself as Chinese during this period, uh, yellow face, uh, an egregious example of it. And so, and that was often romanticized and there've been like six or seven books on uh, Chung Ling Su. And so in researching that, I came across, well, there's this other guy, Ching Ling Fu, who's in fact the guy that William Robinson, who's Chung Ling Su, stole his act from. And I began researching uh, Ching Ling Fu and I found you know, the original Chinese conjure was in fact much more historically important and fascinating than in fact his, his replication in William Robinson. So that began my journey with Fu. And that's what inspired you to write this book. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. It's 430 something pages of an incredibly interesting read, hearing about his different shows, his different travels, some of the challenges that he and his troupe experience, especially here in the US, both in terms of the Chinese immigration and exclusion laws, in terms of their uh, how they were treated by some of their different managers and by the audience, but also how the audiences really came to embrace him and his daughter, Chi Toy. Is, is, uh, is that how you say her name? Yeah, you can say Chi Toy, yes. She was known as Chi Tai when she was younger, but the stage name Chi Toy, yes. Got it, got it. Well, Samuel, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know we'll all have a chance to learn about Ching Ling Fu, his daughter, and their troop. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Well, the focus is going to be on um, the first part of his tour, giving our time constraints, but we're going to try to touch on elements of the second tour and, um, of course, the, the stay on Angel Island. Now, as we discussed, um, Fu was a fascinating character and he was a polymath. And um, it was, as we discussed, there's geopolitical elements to his story. We'll see those apart from just entertainment, uh, the importance of celebrity, international tree, nativism, it, it's all there. He was, um, there were two tours that uh, Fu had. One was um, during the 1898 to 1900 period, and the second was 1912 to 1915. What's remarkable in this period is that he was, for several times during these two uh, tours, the highest paid and most popular performer in the US. And remember, this was the era of the China Exclusion Act. He was making something like $60,000 US a week, uh, which is remarkable. That's in today's dollars. He would be making like 1,500 US a week in the uh, eras of 1898 and 1912. Um, it was Fu who inspired the mania for Chinese magic. So if you think of, um, if you think of uh, all the magic that you've seen that has been China inspired, it all began with Ching Ling Fu in the North American context. There was also you know, a very timely uh, deportation trial in 1899 uh, that was covered across the US again uh, this is a story of technological disruption as well. Fu came up during the emergence of modern media. So that facilitated both his fame and the coverage of so much of his successes. 
Uh, he was also the maker in 1899 of the first sound recordings of Chinese music and singing. And we still have records of those. In 1898, he came to America. And of course, he saw the advances in film. It was only 1896 when Edison had um, invented film as we know it. And 1898, Fu appeared. And in 1911, Fu, who had adopted the technology, uh, made China's first film documentary. And Fu is known as the father of Chinese film. Um, it was a very important documentary as well, Wu Chang Uprising. We'll talk about it later. Um, he also played a significant, Fu also played a significant role in busting the United Booking Office monopoly, which controlled entertainment in the live theater era of the US. He refused to be controlled by them. Uh, and then as uh, has been mentioned, he headlined the Ziegfeld Follies in 1913. Very rare for an act to headline the Ziegfeld Follies and be treated separate almost from the Ziegfeld Follies as Fu was. And ultimately, of course, uh, his greatest impact was his ability to change uh, the impression of Chinese in uh, America during the Chinese Exclusion Act era, where depictions of the Chinese was very much dominated with negative uh, depictions. But uh, background on Fu, he was born uh, in Tianjin in 1854. His father died uh, perhaps when he was 1863. He had developed a stutter and was known, in fact, in Chinese as Zhu the Stutterer. His real name, of course, was Julian Kui, stage name Qingling Fu. Uh, he grew up fascinated by the treaty ports, uh, street magicians and card sharp gamblers who would have been all over a city like Tianjin. Uh, and he also had a childhood illness where he was bedridden. And during that childhood illness, he... Um, developed and honed his skill uh, in magic. And according to some reports, he joined a Tianjin or Tianxin, as it would have been at that time, Society of Magicians, trained for about five years, traveled across China, worked on his skills, and then returned to Beijing in northern China to test himself against the best in the business. And what we know from actual documentation that I've been able to obtain, as opposed to what people have said, is that um, by 1880, uh, Fu had joined the Huayuan Lung Trading Firm, which had offices in Tianjin, Shanghai, Beijing, and of course, San Francisco. And um, this points to the mix in Fu's career between business and magic. And this was, this was continued throughout his entire career. He was a very able uh, businessman, very successful. As we mentioned earlier, he looked at new technologies, film, uh, all these things, had several cinemas, a chain, cinema chain in China, and um, balanced these two elements of his career for a long time. Uh, also important to understand that Fu was a major star before he came to the US in 1898 for the World's Fair. And um, he was known both for ch before Chinese audiences, mixed audiences, and foreign audiences as being a very, very special performer. So the idea is that important thing is that Chinese audiences saw Fu as spectacular. And the magic he did was standard sort of Chinese magic, traditional Chinese magic in its initial form. So the production tricks, the other things like that. And, but the point with Fu was he did these, this standard uh, Chinese magic in a way that gave it a new twist and turn. And he had particular skills in performance and augmenting the nature of his uh, work. So that if he did a, a production act, it was something enormous. It wasn't something small like an egg. So very important to understand that he was also very, very popular and renowned before Chinese audiences in Asia and Asian audiences, and was seen as someone who took what was are, you know, even before the Chinese and Asian audiences, sometimes they would say drearily familiar, uh, you know, traditional magic and gave it something special. So we come to the first tour of the U.S. in 1898 at the Omaha World's Fair. Um, so the Omaha World's Fair in 1898 
It was to celebrate um, the opening of the American West and the emergence of the US as a global power. Uh, President McKinley, electricity, of course, new technologies was, was just emerging at the time. And the wonderful um, buildings that you see here in the images were lit by a button pressed by McKinley in the White House you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So um, the World's Fair in Omaha was quite a special event. Uh, the Chinese government did not officially participate. The Chinese pavilion was built by Chinese um, American investors who lived in the US. The Chinese Manchu government was still protesting the China Exclusion Act. And of course, uh, one of the problems with doing the Chinese pavilion was bringing in Chinese from China, given the current China Exclusion Act. And you see the men here on this slide, um, Treasury Secretary Lehman Gage and um, the Chinese American businessman Hip Lung were the ones who were responsible for getting the special visas for the Chinese workers and artists who helped put the Chinese pavilion together. Uh, there was a special act of Congress that had to be passed to create these special visas for the Chinese who had come for the Chinese pavilion. The Chinese pavilion was a uh, seen to be a recreation of a Chinese city or village, uh, sort of these sort of ethno ethnocentric displays that were common of the time that tried to recreate what an environment was like in a foreign country. And of course, part of that was a theater and in the theater, you could see Ching Ling Fu. And Ching Ling Fu quickly became um, the most popular act at the uh, Omaha World's Fair. And his various illusions, which included a Chinese decapitation illusion, um, juggling, paper tearing, all these sorts of things, uh, just amazed the audiences of 1898. And approximately 3 million people came to Omaha for this fair, and very few of those 3 million did not pass through the Chinese theater to see Fu. And as I mentioned, international, sorry, international, the national media was emerging at the time. You had the new technologies of wire services and other things in operation, and this enabled and increased Fu's fame, because all the newspapers came to the World's Fair and they wrote stories about Fu and his act and the reactions that he received. Now, so all this positive coverage was occurring during this period. And remember, we're talking, this was, um, this was the period of the China Exclusion Act. So what was the, the actual popular media environment? How did it reflect Chinese at that time? Fu was making such a great success. Well, this is something, and Ed and I discussed this before, and he wanted me to make a special note of it. And it is important, um, these sort of, Ur text for how Chinese were perceived in popular culture in the US at this time, sort of the modern era from the gold rush, uh, took place with a poem, a spoken poem uh, called The Heathen Chinese or Plain Language from Truthful James. And I encourage people to look at the history of this poem because uh, I can't give it justice with the time we have allowed here and its impact. But this poem by Bret Hart published in um, 1870, became the most popular poem in the English speaking world and made Bret uh, Hart a star in the, modern, in the modern era. And of course, Bret Hart rivaled the popularity of uh, Mark Twain, who also emerged uh, about the same time as Bret Hart, similar, similar artists and writers. But the heathen Chinese, as it became known, was important because not only was it the pop most popular spoken poem in the English language world for almost over a decade, it was a story about the Chinese, and it was a story about the Chinese in America. And Bret Hart, who was an editor for the Overland Express and was a progressive and supported the Chinese and was aghast at the way they were being treated in uh, post Gold Rush California, wrote the poem as a satire. And the poem, just a, a telescope, because again, we don't have time, basically told the story of two European Americans who invited a Chinese. American to play cards with them, a gambling game. And in the spoken poem, the and this is important to understand, the Chinese gentleman was invited to play cards, gamble with the two European Americans. He initially refused, 
Um, but then they entreated him and said, please, we'll teach you. And he said, I don't know how to play the game. And they said, come on, just you know, bring your money. And finally, he relented and said, okay, okay, I'll play. He sat down with them. And the intention of the two European Americans was to cheat the uh, Chinese American during the card game. And as the card game unfolded and the rounds went around, it was a game of whist, uh, a gambling game popular at the time. The Chinese American won. His name was Ah Sin. He, he was winning. And the, uh, one of the uh, European Americans looked at the other and he represented the working, uh, working man in this poem. And he was uh, furious that you know, they had set up this program to you know, cheat the Chinese uh, gentleman. And he was in fact winning. And he became so angry, he leapt up, he slammed his fists on the table. And remember, this is 1870, we are ruined by cheap Chinese labor, uh, he shouted. And he grabbed the Chinese gentleman, Ah Sin, and the two struggled. And this was the great uh, conclusion of the poem, that as they struggled, the Chinese gentleman's clothes were torn about and his long sleeves opened up and, you know, packets and packets and you know cards and cards flew out of his sleeves so what had happened was the chinese gentleman ah sin had in fact been cheating them and um most of the people reading this 90 percent of them had never met a chinese person but this was the message they got about the chinese so this and this message would follow Fu 40 years later when he appeared in america you know they every place he would go for a performance invariably, you know, eight times out of 10, they would have a quote from the heathen Chinese for ways that are dark and tricks that are vain, the heathen Chinese is peculiar. So this was embedded in the American consciousness when it came to the Chinese. Again, uh, moving up to the time um, Fu actually arrived in America for the World's Fair, 1898 was also the same time uh, The Yellow Danger was published. And, you know, just uh, three years, just three years earlier, the, the painting, which would become known as the Yellow Peril, the Yellow Peril was painted uh, at the request of the leader of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm. It was, you know, a glowing Buddha riding a flaming dragon with his armies coming to threaten Europe. And of course, this was at the point in time where Europe was carving up China. And it was the invasion narrative theme that was being presented. So these were the images people were seeing of um, were seeing of Chinese and China in the midst of uh, in the midst of Fu's arrival. Now going to the great challenger he had in the the copycat, the yellow faced copycat William Robinson. Uh, William Robinson also saw Fu at the World's Fair. He was traveling with American magicians who flocked to. Uh, Omaha to see Fu, and um, he was a technical genius who was supporting the best magicians of the time, and he keenly observed and studied Fu and how he was successful and why he was successful. Another very fascinating uh, event that occurred during the World's Fair in 1898 was the geopolitical side. Well, while Fu was, you know, starring in Omaha, he met Wu Ting Fang. And Wu Ting Fang was the Chinese ambassador to America at the time, who um, would rise at one point to become the acting premier of the Republic of China in 1917 with Sun Yat-sen. And why was uh, Wu Ting Fang in Omaha? Wu Ting Fang was in Omaha because he was there traveling with uh, President McKinley, who had come to um, the Omaha World's Fair to give a speech on world peace. Uh, and why was there a speech on world peace? There was a speech on world peace by uh, McKinley because the Spanish-American War had just ended. And what happened as a result of the Spanish-American War, uh, America acquired Guam, which uh, America still has. They acquired the Philippines, which America doesn't have anymore, uh, um, the Cuba, and of course, in 1898, um, America also acquired Hawaii, not through the Spanish-American War. There's a whole other story to how the U.S. acquired Hawaii. But um, all these um, Pacific elements came under the control of America in 1898. So what we have is, in fact, the first Pacific pivot of America 
during that period when Fu was performing uh, at the Omaha World's Fair. And the reason Wu Ting Fang was with uh, McKinley in um, Omaha was to lobby McKinley to make sure that the China Exclusion Act was not applied to the Philippines because China had so much trade and business with the Philippines. If, if there was in fact, an ex, you know, if they extended the China Exclusion Act to the Philippines, it would be very problematic for the Chinese. Okay, so um, Fu is this tremendous success. He's getting known around the country, but the Omaha Fair comes to an end. And um, he, is, he gives a farewell performance, everyone. He was beloved in that city. It was a big ticket to get Fu to come and have dinner in your home. The top families were inviting he and his family everywhere. And they're having this wonderful impression on everyone. And then after, after Omaha, after Omaha, uh, it's quite interesting because Fu um, began touring in vaudeville but he had his, you know, people familiar with Elvis and Elvis's career will be familiar with Colonel Parker, who was the marketing genius behind Elvis's success. Well, Fu had his Colonel Hopkins, who was the vaudeville marketing success and genius at booming promotion, as it was called at that time. So booming was what they, you know, what they did, referred to as promotion. And um, he made, was exceptionally good at making Fu a star. And one of the things he did that made Fu a star is he said, look, I'm gonna pay this guy $1,500 a week and I'm gonna let everybody know it. And that will be part of what his fame will be built on. And he did. And uh, so there was, what followed was a tremendous success in the um, tremendous success in the Midwest circuit in the US, Chicago and um, down to New Orleans. And then their visas expired. Remember the um, special visas that were passed by a special act of Congress so that the Chinese could appear, their visas expired. And because their visas had expired, um, the Fu Troop was arrested in late March, 1899 in Chicago. And that was huge news. And what's interesting too, is that this news um, was presented in a particularly strange fashion. They didn't, the media at the time didn't talk about the fact that um, Fu, uh, Fu's visa and his Fu troop visas had expired. They said the Chinese emperor wanted him. Uh, so it was quite fascinating that it was presented in this fashion. And uh, part of it was that it was around April 1st. So we all know April Fool's Day, but it wasn't just April 1st because the New York Times on April 2nd on their front page, down in the corner, uh, left-hand side, had a headline saying, you know, Chinese magician to go home, the emperor wants him, and an American official arrests him. So, you know, all the news that's fit to print. So it was interesting that this spin was taken on it. But what happened was the managers who were making so much money and the theatrical companies that were making so much money from Fu weren't about to let this visa stuff stop them from continuing to earn this enormous amount of money with what was you know, a hugely popular act. So they, they challenged, they challenged uh, this, uh, they challenged this decision by the US government and the wonderful you know, rule of law of the American legal system was brought into play. So all this modern structure is emerging. We have modern technology, modern communication, modern entertainment. And with modern entertainment comes modern um, entertainment lawyers. And Adolf Marx was one of the first entertainment lawyers. He cut his uh, teeth with the um, circuses, Barnum and Bailey. And when it emerged and evolved into vaudeville, he was the vaudeville lawyer. So these huge, powerful entertainment companies that had invested in foo brought Adolf Marx in to see if they could overturn the decision um, on an administrative level with regard to Fu having and his troop having to return to China. And Judge, Judge uh, Colsat was the one who had to make the decision when they appealed that. And this was a huge trial. You know, there was always trials of the century. Well, here we go again, another trial of the century. Modern media, the wire services and everything made sure everybody in all the newspapers across uh, the US had a daily report on what was happening to Ching Ling Fu and his family with regard to this 
with regard to this deportation trial. And it also informed a lot of people about the China Exclusion Act who had no idea it existed. Another thing that goes in the midst of this trial, one of the things I wanted to communicate to the San Francisco audience here was where Fu's office was. So in my research on Fu, one of the things that occurred was that I came across in the legal documents, the office, because uh, one of his arguments was he was an authorized, uh, and you can see this in the book, Merchant. If you look at that address, 739 Commercial Street, it has quite a fascinating history. And what is it today? Well, today it's the culture center of the Taipei Economic and Culture Office of Taiwan, which gives you an indication of what was going on with the title to that building and all the different um, entities and characters who had moved in and out of that building over this last hundred years. So the trial comes to a conclusion um, and there's a triumphant decision that the by Colsat, that the Chinese Exclusion Act doesn't apply to Fu because it mainly applies to workers. Um, and Fu is not a worker, he's an artist, and he can stay as long as he wants. And again, uh, enorm uh, very is covered across the US, front page news across the US when the decision comes out, 90% positive saying this is great, but there was the 10 to 20% that said, oh my goodness, here's another loophole in the China Exclusion Act. Okay, and this, as we said, we were gonna focus on the first part of the tour because again, there's so much. Um, you know, this, this provided the last huge boost to Fu's fame that would move him into becoming the biggest star of the time and the highest paid performer of the time. And he moves to Keith's Theater Network which was like the Warner Brothers of um, the time. It was the dominant vaudeville circuit on the East Coast. And he becomes the star of American vaudeville in New York on Broadway, uh, the largest theaters, the most important venues, it is Fu. And there was no one near him in his troupe in popularity and money earned and salaries paid. It, it was just amazing the coverage he got. Uh, talk of the metropolis uh, is his family, the little child Chitai, but the cutest thing that ever happened, the most popular youngster that ever appeared on the stage. And of course, the secrets. There were articles, you know, some of the magicians were jealous. There were stories written about how he did his tricks that were published everywhere. And um, his wife and family were also part of that. So Mrs. Fu um, was seen as graceful and cultured as well. Uh, it was fascinating during the trial that what happened was the, um, the, the people reporting on the trial were startled that she played such an important part in the trial because they could see she was being consulted. She was, had much to say about what was going on during the trial as to, you know, during the translations and all those other things. So we, you know, she was again, a representation and the Fu family was very important because at that time it was a bachelor culture in the U S so that, actually seeing a Chinese family on the stage was a phenomenon. So, you know, this whole idea, you know, the question of assimilation, can they assimilate, you know, the China question of the time of that era, you know, was, was refuted by the, just the presence of the Fu family and their, you know, the embrace that they received within the American uh, environment. So going through the American cities and things like that, it was also, you know, wonderful for the Chinese communities that were there to see a positive representation and response of their people and culture. And, you know, the Fu troupe was embraced and celebrated by the Chinese communities. They were also embraced and celebrated by the magic community. And you have to understand the magic community at that time. Understand there were no movies, there were no radio, there was no television, live theater, vaudeville was the form of entertainment. And the, the, the most important acts, the most important performers in live vaudeville were the magicians. We don't understand it now. But it's if you look at, say, hip hop, you know, um, if you think of the most popular form of entertainment today and you change it and all of a sudden it's magic, that's how powerful magic was at the time. There were magic shops everywhere. Remember, everyone had to do their own sort of entertainment. There were no TVs. There was no film studios, uh, cinemas to speak of. So, you know, just the live theater. So magic had a huge impact and was a form of entertainment that dominated. And the magicians 
uh, loved Fu, and he had a wonderful relationship with him. He was so popular that, you know, at the peak of his, his performing in New York, he was said the only person in America in eight, late 1899 who was more popular than Fu was Admiral Dewey. And the historians among you will know that Admiral Dewey was the man who led the Spanish-American War for the Americans. And they wanted him to run as president. And you know, newspapers, front pages every day were of Admiral Dewey and celebrating his great success in the Spanish-American War. And only Fu challenged Dewey in popularity. But you know, even during all this you know, honeymoon of love for Fu and the Fu troop, the negative tropes and stereotypes about the Chinese orbited the Fu performance. So you would have Fu and his family performing, but across the street, you would have King of the Opium Ring, you know, and you would have the Queen of Chinatown and um, a knight in Chinatown, French maids in Chinatown. And of course, I love the quote featuring degenerates of all classes. And this was, you know, the nature of popular entertainment absent Fu when it dealt with the Chinese. Again, we have Fu, at, during this period, he recorded the first Chinese music and singing. Um, his, his rivalry with Robinson began and um, his imitators began to appear. All the imitators, both Chinese and European, yellow face began to appear. And one thing I wanna mention is the importance of what made his troops so special. It was the unique art and tone, because all these imitators, there were throughout his career, both the second tour, first tour, and in between, endless um, copycats. But they never got the attention, they never got the audiences that Fu and his troop got, because Fu was uniquely charismatic. Fu was uniquely charismatic and a true star. And people wanted to see Fu. They would come back again and again and again to see him. And all the copycats, European, yellow face, Chinese could not match the pull, the magnetism that he had. And during this period, Houdini, of course, appeared. And Houdini was only making $150 a week. Fu was making like $1,500. And they became friends. And Fu, to a certain extent, mentored Houdini. Fu was so big. Part of his legacy is that he, I believe, was the first performer who competed with his own film image. So here is an instance where in April 1999 in New York, you could go see Fu live um, in, at the Bijou Theater or across the street, literally across the street, Broadway and 29th versus Broadway and 30th, you could see a huge film of Fu doing his act. So. This was the first time in history, I believe, this ever occurred. And the film versions of Fu went around the world. You can see you know, this example here. There was a, a world championship boxing match. And the second feature in Australia was a film of Ching Ling Fu. He was also the father of film special effects. Grandfather, I should say, that is discussed in the book. You can take a look at that. That's a fascinating story. Um, and our good friend Wu Ting Fang, the ambassador to China, ends up acting as his agent, so to speak, in negotiating contractual problems during the end of his tour. And he ends up uh, performing in, uh, on stage in the afternoon and at night in one of the first Broadway plays. Uh, after two years touring in the US, Fu is exhausted. He's fighting with his management about his share of the money, even though he's getting an enormous amount. Wu Ting Fang is acting as an arbitrator but the stress and strains begin. And uh, Robinson is emerging as one of the competitors as well. And Fu ends up returning to China in 1900 and walking into the Boxer Rebellion. And last thing, uh, when, he, when Fu returned to China for the Bo and ended up uh, facing the Boxer Rebellion, everyone in the US wanted to know what happened to Ching Ling Fu. So all the news of the Boxer Rebellion was accompanied with what's happened to Fu, where's Fu, is Fu okay? And you see this coverage here. And that was the end of his first tour. Well, Samuel, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know that wasn't nearly enough time to get into all the fascinating details about Ching Ling Fu's life and times, but I hope that it sparks our viewers to read more of your book and learn more about him. We did have one question that came in, which 
was that you had talked about how Ching Ling Fu had inspired a number of Caucasians to assume Asian or Chinese identities and to, to create their uh, own versions of Ching Ling Fu's magic shows. Uh, what can you share about how he might have influenced other Asian uh, actors or performers at the time? So apart from the Europeans, the, the Asian ones as well? Yes, he, he had a huge influence because um, uh, there was a, you know, a flow of Chinese actors and performers into the US as a result of Fu's fame. But again, what I emphasize with both the Chinese performers and the European Im yellow face imitators, none of them really attained Fu's status on the level of popularity or acclaim because you know they they were some very successful you know very successful performers but you know the obviously like the entertainment companies kept looking for the next foo right they wanted you know if they didn't have foo at their theater they wanted someone like foo and this created tremendous opportunities for chinese performers and for yellow face performers right but again repeatedly um you know much to the chagrin of the impresarios who wanted to earn the money you know these these performers never reach the success or popularity of the food troupe. They were definitely unique. Uh, I also just wanted, was wondering if you could spend a, a little bit of time talking about uh, Fu and his troops experiences on Angel Island. So definitely when they came through on their first tour, which is what you focused on for this presentation, Angel Island hadn't been built yet. It wasn't built until 1910. But definitely when he came through for a second tour, uh, they actually were routed to Angel Island, correct? Yeah, it was um, November 12th, 1912, and they were coming in on the steamship Nile, and it's very timely, echoes our current time, uh, you know, it was an era of quarantines and, you know, disease and concerns, and the a doctor, as, as was the practice, was sent out to check the ship before it, you know, came into San Francisco, and on that date, the ship doctor said they had two suspected cases of smallpox, so given there were two suspected cases of smallpox, all 221 passengers were taken to Angel Island, which apart from its immigration services, was also served as a quarantine island and had special facilities. So all 221 passengers were taken to Angel Island. They were all vaccinated, right? They were all vaccinated. They were all given special antiseptic baths. All of their belongings were put into this. And I know Ed has these wonderful photographs of these huge Russian uh, steamers and like a cleaning machines, all their clothing and uh, personal uh, items were put into these huge Russian steamers, all 221 people and cleaned. And they spent about four or five days on the island. And after clearing that period, um, they came to, um, they were allowed to enter San Francisco. And um, the, I think the ship, the ship that came to meet them was the Golden Gate you know, to bring them in. And Oscar Hammerstein was waiting there, the Oscar Hammerstein, who had in fact hired, signed the contract for their second tour. So um, yes, they, they were delayed and spent time on Angel Island. And I believe you guys have the file, yes. And it's also interesting, what I learned from your book as well, is when they came through on the first tour, uh, at the time, performers were considered laborers. And as laborers, uh, they would not have been exempted from the Chinese Exclusion Act or any of the other exclusionary immigration policies. So it required that special visa arrangement to have them recognized as professional performers. Yeah, I think the, the law was unsettled, right? The law was unclear, but it was clear that if you, oh, well, certainly yes, because, you know, remember they, they needed to bring in about 250, a range of different Chinese uh, um, individuals. They needed like uh, carpenters, they needed design people, they needed painting people to set up and create this huge Chinese village. So for that range of people, absolutely. There were, you know, hundreds of people who did not fit the exclusion classes at that time, yes. And then just two more questions for you, Samuel. One of them that came in was if you could talk a little bit more about the movies that were inspired by Ching Ling Fu and maybe uh, I think what the, the person asking the question is referencing is the plays, right? That, that uh, ran at the same time that Ching Ling Fu's uh, uh, magic yeah. act was, was yeah. going on. Yeah. King, well, those actually preceded Fu, right? So this idea of 
king of the opium ring, um, queen of Chinatown, you know, French maids in Chinatown, um, all these sort of, you know, popular confections of all the tropes of China um, and the Chinese uh, preceded Fu. So like 1898, we had, you know, the Yellow Peril being published. Fu walked into that and the Fu troop, right? They didn't originate or stimulate it, but his popularity resulted in all these plays clustering around him whenever he would appear. So, you know, if you couldn't get a ticket to see Fu, well, you could go see, you know, King of the Opium Ring or something like that. And what was interesting about those depictions is the concept of Chinatown. And it really was, you could see that the, uh, it was obviously all the tropes were vice, opium, deceit, corruption, all these sorts of issues, but it was there to titillate the audience, right? It was there. And the idea that was, and a theme that was throughout these entertainments was that Chinatown was a place where you went to lose your identity. So like, for example, one of these plays, uh, the story was of a 16, 17 year old girl in the Midwest who was supposed to marry, her father had set her up to marry uh, a local you know, accountant at the bank. And she fled this horrible fate by running to New York and disappearing into Chinatown, you know, the wonder of Chinatown. And the father and the, you know, boring accountant chased after her into New York to find her. And they too were disappeared into the wonder of Chinatown and quote, lost their identities. And so it was quite fascinating to see the role that Chinatown played is in its, you know, projection by the Western imagination as this sort of place where you could go and lose your identity. And it was obviously a very something people wanted to do a lot as they do now, lose your identity. And Chinatown supposedly was one of the places you could do that. Whether the residents appreciated that was another thing, but uh, certainly those who were you know, creating the tropes, that was something that they did. Samuel, I have one last question for you. And that is where can people who might be interested in learning more about Ching Ling Fu uh, purchase your book? Amazon.com always works. Um, you can just Google it. And there's also like Barnes and Noble and, you know, in Canada, Indigo. So the usual, the usual suspects as far as where you can buy books. You can also go to chinglingfubio.com, which is our website. You can see some interesting stuff about, you know, some of the other articles that I've written and things like that on Fu. And um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, they, they can certainly go to those spots. Wonderful. And also just a quick plug that uh, the graphic novel that you'd worked on, Constable King's Mysteries of Old Shanghai, are also now available in the U.S. on Amazon. Yeah, yeah Amazon.com is another always like you, they're available a lot of places, but Amazon.com is one of the places it's easiest for people to connect with them. Yes. And my in fact, the Nathaniel Scobie is the pen name I use for my graphic novels. But the, that will that will get you there, Constable Kong, for sure. And that focuses on Old Shanghai which again, I'll just say quickly, old Shanghai is to me very important because it's uh, an emerging China meets the West 1.0. And now we're an emerging China meets the West 2.0. And as always, the past is never over. And we're just seeing the same things again and again and again. Right, definitely. We are doomed to repeat history when we don't learn from it. Uh, thank you so much, Samuel, for sharing your research and your writing with us. Uh, and thank you to all of you who tuned in. If you enjoyed tonight's free program, then we definitely encourage you to uh, help support our future efforts by making a donation. And you can do that by going to our website, which is www.aiisf.org backslash donate. And your support helps us to ensure that we can continue our important work of not only preserving and maintaining the buildings at the National Historic Landmark at Angel Island, but also to uplift the histories and stories of other immigrants and other visitors like Ching Ling Fu who have connections to Angel Island. And then I invite all of you to come back and join us for our September Author Spotlight, which will feature Chris Barron, who is the author of The Magical Imperfect. And this is a book that was written for middle school aged youth that focuses on the friendship between Ethan, who is the grandson of a Jewish immigrant who came through Angel Island, as well as Malia, a young girl who lives with severe eczema. And so with that, uh, I wanna say thank you again. 
please stay uh, in connection with us and stay tuned. Follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, so that you can keep appraised of the different events and programs that we've got coming up. And also for those of you who live in the Bay Area or even in the U.S. or around the world, want to make sure that we invite you to come and visit Angel Island State Park in person. There is nothing like walking on the actual site and walking in the halls of the buildings to really feel that palpable sense of history and emotion and connection to these histories and stories of Ching Ling Fu, as well as of those immigrants who were processed and detained at Angel Island. So thank you very much again, Samuel, and thank you all of you. With that, we'll go ahead and end tonight's program and wishing everybody health and safety in the coming weeks and months.